Central to the fifth edition of Dungeons & Dragons is the idea that players control characters in a rule-governed environment who get stronger and more interesting across a series of victories. Completely antithetical to that, therefore, would be an environment where there's no rules, where everything is surreal, and where death or doom is absolutely certain. And yet, that is exactly the description for the Ravenloft Domain of Dread called Clore. It only has a few paragraphs in Van Richten's guide, but if you're like me, you were fascinated as soon as you read it. It's at once intriguing, but also forbidding. How on earth do you write an adventure that's set here? It's like trying to write an adventure that's set on a Yes album cover. Like, how are you supposed to get the feel of that thing? And yet, that is exactly what we are going to do today. Welcome to PhD and D, everyone. I'm Dr. Bowers, and we're going to talk about the Ravenloft domain of dread called Clore. After sketching what the domain is supposed to be in its own terms, I'm going to touch on a few different works of art that can help you get an imaginative grip on what this domain is supposed to feel like, and then we'll sketch out an adventure for high-level PCs. The hallmarks of Clore are impending doom and a surreal environment, and we get this sort of description. Clore is the end of worlds. Here, shattered islands drift through a misty netherworld caught in a swirling spiral that ends at the unignorable burning eye called Clore. Thirteen stars orbit this sun-like sphere, one winking out every hour. Each time one of the stars dies, one of the domain's ruined islands is drawn into Clore and consumed by the flames. With it, each other island wrenches ahead, then halts one hour closer to the same doom. So what we're supposed to imagine is 13 different single-planet solar systems, each of them in a line, and they're on a kind of conveyor belt headed unstoppably into this cosmic furnace, a blazing eye. This means that if we want to set an adventure in this sort of setting, we're probably going to have PCs hopping from planet to planet trying to outrun the speed at which those planets are absorbed into Clore. And we'll also want to thematize hopping from planet to planet in addition to the themes of inevitable doom and cosmic weirdness. Additionally, the fact that this is supposed to be a place where domains go to die, where the remnants of lost or disintegrated domains of dread are consumed, it would make sense for the PCs to start out in one of these domains. A domain like Darkon, which is fading away and being consumed by Shadowfell Mist because of the absence of its Dark Lord, for instance. It doesn't have to be Darkon, but something like that. That's where we'll begin the adventure that we're going to sketch out. But before we sketch that out, let's talk about some different cultural influences that can help us imagine what Clore is supposed to be like, or at least generate the right sort of mood when sketching out an adventure for this place. First, I want to mention the last few episodes of the 2021 Marvel streaming series Loki, where the protagonists find themselves in this sort of apocalyptic wasteland full of leftover things, hemmed in by a destructive mist in which there lurks a colossal, world-consuming kaiju named Aliath. We're going to take that sort of setting and that sort of monster and use it in the very first act of our adventure. Next, episode 10 of season 3 from the original 1961 series The Twilight Zone with Rod Serling is called The Midnight Sun. It's a short, horrifying story about the planet Earth veering off of its orbit and getting closer and closer and closer to the sun. We witness what seems to be the last few days of a couple of neighbors in an apartment block who are struggling to stay sane in the face of the inevitable. It's really intense and imaginative, and it does capture some of the heavier feelings that you might get from this setting. I also highly recommend Junji Ito's manga novel Hellstar Remina from 2005. This is a cosmic horror story about a colossal planet that eats worlds, and it's headed towards the solar system, and indeed, it eats up our solar system. It features action on a scale which is going to match that of our adventure, and it also has a certain dose of the same kind of horrifying cosmic weirdness that we're going to want. On that note, I also recommend the 2019 sci-fi action film from China called The Wandering Earth. In this exciting movie, scientists have equipped Earth with rockets in order to propel it out of the distance where the sun is going to expand into a red supergiant. As they're propelling the Earth, they need to steer it out of the range of Jupiter's gravitational pull, and again, it has action on a certain kind of grand scale that we're going to want to emulate when we describe our high-level PCs hopping from planet to planet as those planets are getting consumed in chlor. I might also mention the novella The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry from 1943, because it features a kind of morbidity and it does feature a protagonist moving amongst planets. It's a little more whimsical than the feeling we would want for our adventure, though, so let's not lean too heavily on that as an influence. 
Instead of the whimsical planets from The Little Prince, consider using the dreary landmarks from Heart, the City Beneath, that 2020 RPG by Rowan Rook and Deckard, written by Grant Howitt and Christopher Taylor. If you flip through the Heart sourcebook, specifically on the Landmarks section, you're going to find all kinds of weird, imaginative, surreal, horrific settings that would be perfect for the kinds of planetoids that are getting absorbed into Chlor. Indeed, we're going to take one of them, the one called High Rise. And as a final imaginative influence, I would really recommend looking at photos of this nebula, the Hex Nebula NCG 7293. Some people call it the Eye of God Nebula. It's a colossal, spooky, natural phenomenon which I think could serve as some imaginative inspiration for the Eye, which is Chlor. So, with influences out of the way, let's sketch out the acts of this adventure. It's going to be a high-level adventure, with PCs starting out at level 16 and continuing up through level 20. Not only will they reach level 20, they will have plenty to do once they reach level 20. In Act 1, the PCs all encounter each other at the very end of the world. All that is left of their entire planet is a little fragment of land hemmed in by mists and menaced by a colossal monster. They fight that monster. And although their victory means their survival, the world itself is consumed. In Act 2, the PCs wake up on a tiny planetoid in a cosmic expanse in which they can see multiple stars, but those stars are all horrifically lined up in an orderly queue, a queue that leads to a fiery eye in space, impossibly huge, that's eating the stars and the planets, one by one. Realizing that they are in danger, the PCs then hop to the next planet away. In Act 3, the PCs land on the next planetoid away, and they find that everything on the entire planet is some form of star spawn or eldritch enemy. They must struggle to escape this planetoid, struggle to move on to the next planetoid, but in the process of so doing, they face several waves of aberrant monsters. In addition to that, they face many Far Realm encounters from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. When PCs reach the next planetoid in Act 4, they find it is occupied by a death cult who have used magical energy to increase the planetoid's gravity so that the PCs cannot easily escape. They must deal with this death cult. Once they do, they discover a chest that is absolutely full to the brim of spell scrolls. Every spell that could be inscribed has at least one copy in that chest. Naturally, the PCs should take it with them when they move to the next planetoid. In Act 5, the PCs land on a crystalline planetoid where every surface is reflective, and we're going to let it be a mirror zone from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. After struggling in that setting, they leave that planetoid and move on to Act 6. In Act 6, the PCs land on an intelligent planetoid that is alive, it's a living creature, and it doesn't want to let them go. They must fight the planet itself before moving on. And of course, given that the PCs are level 20, one thing that you might do with this campaign is let it be unending. Let there be no escape. Let it just be one of those things that you return to and have fun with level 20 characters with, throwing weird planetoid after weird planetoid at them. But assuming that you do want to bring this campaign to an end, you can have the PCs get to the very edge of Chlor, where they find that the space is actually hemmed in by a misty nebula. If they manage to fly into that misty nebula, they face Chlor himself. And we could have a very interesting and peculiar sort of boss fight, which I will sketch out later. Okay, so to begin, our PCs are level 16, and they all meet each other at the very end of the world, both spatially and temporally. The planet which the PCs call home has been consumed slowly, bit by bit, by an all-encompassing, all-encroaching mist. Within that mist there writhes and roars a colossal, dragon-esque creature which devours towns and hillsides, a world-ending beast like that foretold in the pages of ancient religious texts. Each of the PCs has fled this destructive trail. Each of the PCs has managed to survive only because of their expertise, only because of their strength. And now, at the end of the world, everyone is dead except for the strongest, the most powerful, the most heroic, and the luckiest. In short, the PCs. They meet together in the last scrap of land that hasn't been swallowed up, a mere acre of field, surrounded by the darkening, carnivorous mist. They have just enough time to introduce themselves and do a small amount of socializing before it's time to face the colossal monster, which is the mist, the monster which has eaten the world. Again, for imaginative inspiration, we're drawing on Eliath from those last few episodes of the Loki series. And we could give it the statistics of a Tarrasque, or maybe since they're only level 16, a Tarrasque, but it's dialed back a little bit. But the PCs must fight it. Assuming they defeat it and survive, they get to level up to 17, at which point the mist, which surrounds them like an ocean, floods, engulfing them anyway. In Act 2, the PCs are level 17, and they wake up on a planetoid adrift in a cosmic expanse, where, past their own sun, they can see a row of other suns, each with its own planetoid, 
and they can see how this string of solar systems are headed towards this amazingly huge, impossibly huge, flaming cosmic eye that is consuming them. They're on a conveyor belt to their destruction, headed towards the saw blade. And they must find a way in order to get to the next planetoid. The next one that's further away from this world-consuming eye that they're headed towards. How are they going to do that? Well, that's up to them. They're level 17. They should be able to figure something out. Even if all of the player characters are fighters, you can play a game of yes and with the DM. The players can ask, ooh, are there any magnets? Ooh, is there anything to burn? Is there any of this? Is there any of that? And depending on what their plan is, the DM can work with them. But their task is to get off of this planetoid and to get to the next one. Once they leave the surface of the planetoid, each of them must make a DC-20 constitution save to avoid taking 30 cold damage and 30 psychic damage in the vacuum in between the planetoids. At level 17, that shouldn't be enough to kill them. And if it is, hey, congratulations, you made a high-level adventure challenging. Assuming they make the save, have them take half damage, and they level up to 18 when they get to the next planetoid, and we go to Act 3. In Act 3, the PCs touch down on a horrific world with fleshy trees, tumor-like boulders, and all manner of unwholesome alien monsters. In Junji Ito's manga Hellstar Ramina, there's an unfortunate family of astronauts who actually travel to the surface of that apocalyptic world-eating planet that's headed towards Earth, and they touch down on it, and what they find, the horrors that they find there, should be inspiration for populating the surface of this planetoid. Let all of the trees be Yashlals. Let there be star spawn everywhere. Throw in at least one colossal monster and have it be some kind of Shoggoth thing. The PCs should have to defeat these monsters and then find a way to get to the next planetoid. Once they do, assuming the same hazards moving in between planetoids with that icy vacuum, they can level up to 19 and we're in Act 4. Act 4 is explicitly taken from Heart the City Beneath. It's the landmark called High Rise. What we have on this next planetoid is a series of square towers. Each tower is like 30 to 50 stories high. But for each tower, floors 27 or so down are all haunted. And indeed, most of the surface of the planet, all the way up to floor 27 or so, is filled with ethereal, incorporeal, angry undead creatures. Ghosts, banshees, wraiths, specters, gallows speakers, you name it. If it's vaporous, undead, and angry, it's down there in multitudes. High atop the towers are a dozen or more archmages who are all part of a death cult. They know the circumstances that they are in, and they have developed this strange religion in their final hours. They are the cult of the swan dive. They have used their magical abilities together to ensure that nobody can leave the planetoid because its gravity is too great. They will not die in the eye of Chlor, they have vowed. They will die of magical power, of gravity of their own making. They see themselves as doing a little bit of good as each of them, as a kind of rite of initiation, travels a few stories down to fight some ghosts, release them from the pain of undeath, and then return back. And once they return back a hero, they throw themselves over the edge of the tower to die a dignified death. When the PCs arrive, of course, they are invited, nay, insisted to join the cult, and the archmages are not going to let anyone leave. Not only is the gravity too great, but they will use violence and magic to oppose the PCs if they try to leave anyway. So the PCs must deal with this cult. Either through persuasion or more likely through violence, they have to defeat a dozen arch wizards or arch mages. And once they do, they should discover a chest. This chest has at least one copy of every single spell that can be inscribed on a scroll. Let this be the ultimate treasure. It should be a major upbeat in what is otherwise a very dour story. Does it have scrolls of wish? Sure but you can't wish your way out of Chlor. And DMs, of course, should feel free to do a monkey's paw twist with any similar sort of wish that would be an easy way out of this adventure. But once they find this, it should make it a lot easier for them to hop to the next planetoid, and when they do, they should take this chest with them. Level up to 20, and then we're in Act 5. In Act 5, the PCs touch down on a crystalline planet. In addition to having a geodesic surface, it has many spires and spines, all manner of crystal growths, but all of the crystals are reflective, like hematite or like glass. And we're going to make it into a mirror zone, following the rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. 
Once the PCs touch down, in other words, they're going to be faced with all kinds of bizarre psychedelic hazards, and they're going to fight reflections of themselves, which are various sizes and which are distorted in various ways, and which can have all manner of different monster statistics, depending on what it would be fun for the PCs to fight. You can have a lot of fun with this Hall of Mirrors sort of setting. When the PCs are trying to escape, you could reveal that in fact they were not headed towards the sky, but a reflection of the sky that is actually on the surface of a cliff's face, and they bash right into that cliff's face, cracking the mirror. Maybe they try to cast a spell on an ally in the middle of battle, and they find that they accidentally cast it on a reflection instead, and so on. Once the PCs deal with the mirror zone for an appropriate amount of time and decide to leave the planetoid, we move on to Act 6, which, if this campaign comes to an end and is not endless, is our penultimate act. In Act 6, the PCs touch down on what seems to be a planetoid, but its surface is scaly and fleshy, it's covered in ridges, and its wildlife are things which look like the parasites that would infect a lizard or some other animal. In fact, the planetoid is a dragon, which is coiled up. The dragon is dreary, depressed, hopeless, and nihilistic. When the PCs land, it wants to talk philosophy with them. It reasons that something must have created the world, but then whatever that is must have had a creator too, and whatever created that must have a creator. And it will ask the PCs about the first cause, about the edge of space, about all kinds of cosmological mysteries, because it wants company. Now this could be a fun bit of socializing, but as soon as the PCs try to leave, the dragon will not let them. It is resolves itself to die in the eye of Chlor, and it doesn't want to die alone. It's decided it's going to take the PCs with them. And so the PCs must now fight a colossal world-sized dragon in space. You could use the statistics for a Tarask again, but I think it might be more fun to have a bunch of different colossal monsters. And you could say that one of them is just the dragon's head, and another one is the dragon's right claw, and another one is the dragon's left claw. You could take one of those ultimate boss monsters with the mythic traits from Mythic Odysseys of Theros. Have them fight that world-destroying Hydra, for instance. Once the PCs defeat this planetoid, they move on either to another planetoid that you thought of, because this campaign is just going to go on forever with the PCs trapped in Chlor, and every time you have a session you just throw another interesting scenario at the PCs, or the PCs reach the very edge of the domain. They find that this weird domain, this series of single planet solar systems on their way to destruction, has an edge. It's hemmed in by a misty gray nebula. If they leap into the nebula, they must confront and defeat Chlor himself, who, according to the text of Van Richten's guide, is an obsessed clockmaker. Now, when it comes to Chlor himself, I like to think of Mad Jim Jaspers from the Marvel Universe. Mad Jim Jaspers is this omnipotent being, this all-powerful creature that can warp and destroy realities. But he looks like a schlubby dude in a bad suit with a mustache. It's this surreal combination of the quotidian and the cosmically powerful. I suppose you have similar things in the pages of Stephen King with characters like Randall Flagg. But when I think of Clore, I think of Jim Jaspers. The comic books I'm thinking of are The Mighty World of Marvel numbers 8 through 12, where Mad Jim Jaspers takes over England and the world and the universe and does some really weird psychedelic stuff in the latter pages. And it's worth taking a look at that if you want some inspiration. I guess I should have mentioned that earlier. But what's going to happen is this. The PCs will find themselves floating in a gray nebula, and they will hear the voice of Chlor first. A disembodied, booming voice. It's going to laugh at them and sneer, and ask who they think they are and what they think they're trying to do. And don't they realize that everything comes to an end? Everything has its scheduled end, like clockwork. Your hour must come. And the PCs can interact with this voice and perhaps goad it into taking a bodily form. Again, I'm thinking Jim Jaspers. Have it just look like an ordinary watchmaker, but like giant and malevolent. And I think rather than just having a normal fight or battle with hit point exchanges and attacks and things, make this a puzzle battle. The PCs have a chest that's full of spells that they can cast, any spell, and Clore can taunt them in various ways about how he cannot be harmed. So one thing you could do is have Clor taunt the PCs in a way which is actually a hint or a clue or a riddle about which spell they should cast. For instance, Clor could say, I am integral. I am integrated into this domain. You cannot destroy something so integral, something so integrated as me. That's a clue for the PCs to cast disintegrate. Or perhaps he boasts that the PCs cannot stop him. And that's a clue for them to cast time stop. Perhaps he boasts of being irreducible, and so the PCs have to cast Enlarge Reduce. 
that type of puzzle battle or riddle battle or whatever you want to call it might be a more fitting end for this campaign than just another slugfest, because we've had plenty of those so far. If and when Chlor is defeated, it is with a booming, universe-shattering shriek, time and space torn asunder, reality and possibility unstrung like the knees of a Mycenaean hero who died in Ilium. And thus the end of worlds meets its own, at least temporary, end. There's nowhere for the PCs to level up to, but they go on to their next adventure, if there is one. So that's Chlor. It's a weird domain, isn't it? What do you think? Is this anything like what you would plan to run if you were going to run an adventure in Chlor? What are your inspirations for what this domain is supposed to be like? What did you immediately think of when you read those cryptic paragraphs in Van Richten's Guide? Did you have a specific way that you were imagining Chlor? How would you handle this? This is such a weird and fun domain. Let me know in the comments. Once again, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe, do all those internet things. Hit the bell icon if you want notifications on the weekly updates that I always provide on this channel. And thank you very much. See you in the next one.